Alekum the Kol Yisrael for rule. Amen. So coming to you today, uh, just coming back from Montreal, Ottawa. So we're gonna do is um, we're gonna talk about Don's case a bit to you. So I really haven't spoken to you publicly about that right now that it's in front of the appeals. But I'm just gonna give you a brief history of uh, the incidents that led up to 2012 and uh, the court, the two trial uh, cases, uh, trials, uh, prelim that was actually brought to trial in 20, uh, after the charges proceeded in May 2012. Now initially uh, what happened is um, SWAT team members came into my residence about five minutes after I departed uh, on Searle Street. And my son Don and uh, Wendy, his sister, were in the uh, in the house at the time. And they came in. Um, according to the young youth, there was there was no knock at the door. So I know that in uh, in in the court, not the court, but the uh, one of the laws state civil law that there must be a knock upon the door before entry, before uh, they can actually. Uh, destroy the door. So this is what happened without a knock. So after that, they stormed in and uh, immediately when they entered the home, they noticed uh, the first bedroom door is open where my daughter was at 14 at the time on a computer. So she's on a computer and naturally she, she uh, hears the noise beforehand. I'm just, I really haven't talked to her in depth about this, but I will be interviewing her when she's ready to talk about it because actually that night after it happened, she actually went to live with her mother after eight years of me raising her and her brother on my own after returning from Europe. So it's very traumatic to her. So I don't picture her actually sitting on the bed quietly as if she don't hear the front door being torn down without a knock, without an introductory. Imagine that for a second. So in any case, the door is being destroyed and torn down. And all of a sudden, um, 15 to 20 SWAT members are in your living room and maybe three or four in your bedroom pointing uh, some machine guns at you. And apparently she was in her underwear, night clothes, um, ready to retire or relaxing. As machine guns were drawn on her, she was told to leave the room while the guns are still being pointed, as they proceeded, the rest of the crowd, the SWATs, proceeded to, to my son's bedroom, where um, he was kicked to the floor and beating, beaten into a uh, point of concussion, which we have documents, doctor reports that uh, speak to this. What's important is that from that point, after two hours of um, him being detained in his bedroom, uh, being beaten, kicked in the back, kicked in the head, um, they left, the SWAT team left. Detectives put a microphone, before they left, he actually put a microphone to his mouth to uh, force a confession. At that time, he um, did not speak to them because he doesn't know what they're talking about. So they left. I arrived, I actually arrived, uh, and I seen him a few blocks away from the house at the gas station because they took his cell phones. He was trying to reach me. I was actually at the Danny program, which is a basketball program organization uh, developed towards uh, adults with disabilities to uh, steer them back into independence. So I was actually maybe eight minutes away at my program. So I had seen him, my son, on the way back at the gas station and he's all bruised up, he's dizzy, he's uh, he's just, he don't know really what's going on. So I rushed him to uh, North York General Hospital at that time, which was on Shepherd and Finch. Um, he told me the story. Um, at that time, he started communicating with detectives, what the hell went on here, the, the door is destroyed. 
the actual owner of the house I had to communicate with. We took pictures. Uh, I had about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in damages to personal items. The door itself of the house was destroyed. Uh, it was paid four thousand to the owner. I was told by Detective Van Singer that any damages or any uh, claims that the Toronto Police Department 32nd Division would take care of those claims. This, of course, never happened. <clears throat> so I took him to uh, court. I sued him, and I was begged uh, by the uh, police attorney to please drop the charges against the lawsuit against the cop, the detective, uh, because it hurts his ability to, uh, to to climb the ladder or get promotions. After I seen that they were uh, not playing fairly as far as my damages are concerned, I just dropped the case. I dropped the lawsuit. Okay, back to the case now. So trial one <clears throat> commenced around 2015. Uh, I was on the impression that at the time, uh, my son's lawyer drew some juvenile cases was uh, attorney Ashton Hall. So not unbeknown to me, Mr. Hall had actually been called up, called up to the to the bench. But I called his law firm and spoke to a young lady called uh, Victoria Tucci, who told me at the time that actually Mr. Hall, although he had been called up to the bar, he's still involved in a law firm, and she would assure me that he would be informed of the case, kept up to date, and also be advisory advisory on this case if I obtained, retained her uh, under his company. We found out that this wasn't true, but in uh, any case, we went to bat with Victoria Tucci. In the prelim, um, the gentleman that was actually found with the murder weapon um, said to the judge that he never seen my son before, is not familiar with him, and despite this gentleman having the murder weapon, he was not being uh, cooperative. Um, so what happened is the preliminary judge, under the orders of the prosecution, uh, Sheila Cressman, and I think Daniel Santis, uh, were able to acquire a, an agreed statement of facts for this person that's been found with the murder weapon. That according to his cell phone, he wasn't in the area at the time of the murderers which was enough to suffice the prosecution and detectives that this man was not guilty. Uh, at least he wasn't in a situation, of, despite having a murder weapon, where he could be charged with murder, but only possession. And being able to skate past a murder charge, not being corroborative as far as where he got the weapon from, why was he posing on Facebook with the weapon, etc., etc. So, a witness who was told by this gentleman, we're not sure of his correct name, because the name on the warrant to his house where the weapon was found is very important, because that name must be on the warrant, the correct name. So. The preliminary judge, under the persuasion of the prosecution, um, discounted testimony from a witness who heard firsthand this individual found with a murder weapon uh, confess to the killings of the Waterman brothers in public. And I actually met this young lady in the hallway. She was actually looking for Victoria Tucci at the preliminary. And I didn't know who she was, and I directed her to the courtroom. Later, I found out that um, she was the witness. Actually, Miss Tucci told me. It's kind of interesting as I look back, because Tucci, attorney Tucci, was like uh, immediately when she said that the young lady is here because she heard firsthand confession. Um, we feel that she may be on drugs and she's had some situations with the uh, criminal record. I, I took that, you know, first-hand information. It's being offered by the defense lawyer. Okay. So I'm not really paying any attention to it. 
but we found out later that this young lady was disqualified her testimony very important testimony uh, fingers the suspect was found with the murder weapon confesses openly to this young lady and after this uh, preliminary appearance she um, not only was disqualified by the prosecution but I guess um, later changed her statement and was um, it was uh, known that she was uh, in my opinion intimidated because one would expect that if a young lady with a young baby is testifying in a murder case that the murderer told confessed to her we want to put this young lady in protective custody which did not happen but what happened is she was possibly intimidated and told to recant her statement by either the murderer or people who are known to him so all of this was excluded from both juries under an agreed statement of facts that basically says that this young, this young man who was found with a murder weapon, according to his cell phone, Towers, did not, does not put his cell phone in the locations of the, murder, the murders that day. Now this is an assumption that was uh, relayed to the jury as evidence, an agreed statement of facts as evidence that according to his cell phone, the prosecution and the um, detectives, all 21, agreed that according to this guy's cell phone, Doug Mercer, whatever his name is, the white guy, we're going to believe that despite having a murder weapon, he was not in the area. So this was uh, allowed in, this case was allowed in against Don Johnson uh, based upon uh, an agreed statement of facts and also uh, a number of texts that were gathered from, gathered from uh, a couple cell phones that Mr. Johnson had in his possession uh, in his bedroom. And these uh, texts were repetitively put into the air like mantras. The first jury didn't buy into it because there were certain terms that the prosecution, um, along with a so-called uh, urban language expert, a detective by the known as uh, known as uh, Gantz, uh, from the Melvern area. And according to this detective, who's testified in numerous uh, cases, the term ratchet, uh, he's never come across. So we have a text from Don Johnson to one of his friends uh, shortly after this uh, terrible, terrible situation, uh, referring to in the text, because you know what's interesting is that to break down language, I would have expected a professor of English uh, not so much uh, for the urban aspect of uh, the, the uh, criminal subculture or I say criminal subculture because what they were discussing in this situation wasn't actually criminal. It was an actual um, slang language that only I think an English professor who may have some knowledge of uh, street lingo, but definitely the subject matter would be able to put in context and distinguish um, the different parts and break down the actual sentence. Because if you break down the sentence, in this case, um, Don Johnson was in communication with um, one of his buddies, Joe Edwards, and a conversation, um, according to Mr. Johnson and according to myself, because, I mean, I guess it would have been a conflict of interest for me to actually uh, break down this language that I'm very, very familiar with, uh, taking my background, my history, and my um, my employment in the community as a social uh, sports communicator, mentor, um, motivator, and coach. I am very familiar with the language. Uh, keep in check is a uh, set of words 
that relate to urban street language stemming from the inner cities of the United States. I've spoken this word when I was in high school many times through basketball. Um, it's relayed uh, to, to uh, you know, basically relate to what it means. Keep in check can mean uh, from first face value, I would say, okay, keep in check, keep in touch, but it doesn't mean keep in touch. Keep in check means to keep things in order, keep it organized, keep it under the radar, keep it check, take care of it, monitor it, protect it, stay on top of it, all right? Ratchet is a word that goes with un, beyond question the, the meaning because it's been found in uh, many movies, many films, and has also been around since the 1970s and actually originated in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I think they were speaking this word in the 60s it would relate to a young lady who is, um, we're not going to talk about pigment, but one who is a I'll give you the definition, um, ghetto street whore, um, someone who is um, into a certain type of lifestyle um, that involves promiscuous behaviors, um, indecency, um, actions, words, certain type of music, black culture, forgive me for this term, nigger, nigger culture, uh, it relates to that. Now, my son and his friends and his network sent texts, numerous texts, that were applied to this case that the Crown manipulated and managed to uh, deceive a naive and possibly biased jury, which actually started with 14 members and was reduced to 11 the day of the verdict. One juror actually dropped out the morning of the day of the verdict. Um, so back to this language of words, because they manipulated a set of people, peers, I guess you could say, but really they were not peers to the accused because none of them uh, I guess you could say could actually relate to that which is defined as a, a peer and this is obvious because the evidence in this case um, which mounted to zero percent was actually taken um, seriously by an 11 person jury reduced to 11 that brought into a false narrative based on assumptions now we can say that the earth floats in a 360 degree cycle around the sun and the sun around the sun rotation and this is based upon an assumption that the antiquity of the ecliptic, which is the axis, sustains this rotation. This is scientific proof that backs this, and physics back this. So it's not based upon a assumption, an assumption but upon a physical, concrete, mathematical reality. So we consider words, terms, evidence, especially circumstantial evidence, we must be cautious, especially when you relate a, uh, a I'm talking about a judge now, when you relate certain information to a jury, 
who is not uh, exposed to understanding way on a daily basis and making decisions upon reasonable doubt, which is a term that we can apply to the English language on a daily basis, but when we're dealing with a judicial system and measuring evidence in a case, it's not the same. So when the judge relates, okay, I'll give you a term, I'll give you a, uh, a statement that the judge made in his, uh, they call it briefing, so it's not the right term, but it's, it's when he gives a charge to the jury to go into the deliberations with an open mind and certain uh, concrete mantras that he puts into the air, which can go, which can sway one direction or the other. And in this case, it, it definitely went into the negative because, and this is a part of the appeals. Judge O'Mara, in one of his charges to the jury, he said that if, if Mr. Johnson, in one of the videos, the Crown Prosecutor, lead prosecutor, Sheila Cressman, insinuated that Mr. Johnson was actually holding a weapon in a hallway um, on a practice run prior to the robbery, which she designed the narrative, which the jury brought into, was a rehearsal for the murder. And there were other things that she'd done, certain gestures that she uh, implied that were also uh, practice skits for the murders. So one in particular was she argued that there was a gun in Mr. Johnson's hands but from the video poor quality and the quality even within his state I believe and many other people believe that there was not any weapon in his hand but yet it was just his glove and if he has practiced the art of magic, unbeknownst to me as his father, uh, that I am deceived. Because if there was a gun, it disappeared in front of Plain's eyesight view. But in any case, O'Mary, the judge O'Mary said to the jury in one of his charges, if, if you believe as a jury member that a week prior to the murders, Mr. Johnson had a gun, then you must convict him. This is very interesting. A week before the robbery, which accidentally went into a murder, not accidentally, but the intended people turned the aggression on the young men who were actually trying to rob this this uh, white guy, uh, Doug Mercer, whoever his name is. Um, a week before, cannot speak to a week later. Because first of all, if there was a gun in his hand, where's the gun? How can we say that it is the gun? And how can the judge make such a charge with no such investigational uh, material, evidence, ballistics, or even a actual virtual gun in the video. That's number one. Number two, the individual found with the murder weapon, who was a hostile witness, who was screened from testifying said in court in the preliminary that he did not know Mr. Johnson personally and never seen him before in his life. So here's the person that was found with the murder weapon, not cooperative with the detectives, but yet not charged with the murders, although he had the murder weapon, making statements in clear court that he does not know Mr. Johnson. So if he does not know Mr. Johnson, despite he himself having a murder weapon, he has basically excluded Mr. Johnson from the murders. This is 
very important concept. It's not rocket science. It, it, it speaks to a silent, agreed statement of facts, which have been set above common sense, which is the foundation in this case, in my opinion, of the reasonable doubt. Because if the murder Ra is this gentleman with the weapon, and he has stated that his gun belongs to him, on which he's posed and posted pictures on Facebook, which is a social social worldwide media, has made a statement that he does not know Mr. Johnson. So he's not only excluded Mr. Johnson from the murder itself with this weapon, but also any type of theory or narrative. Now the unspoken narrative is where the prosecution and the detectives failed. Because the individual with the murder weapon, we cannot exclude him. We cannot exclude him. He's been excluded. He's been protected from prosecution. He's been protected from being charged where he would have to prove his case beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond his inability to be a uh, cooperative suspect, even having a murder weapon, detectives and prosecutions are okay with that. And why are they okay with this? This is the question. And why is this person being protected from prosecution and not being helpful despite having a murder weapon and not knowing the accused is basically um, excluded and eliminated the accused from any participation in the murder. Murders, much less robbery. Because Mr. Johnston was on camera doing the robbery, standing at a wall. So how can one standing at a wall as a lookout in a robbery pull the trigger not only through several walls, but is able to kill two men in an opposite corridor between two walls, several apartments of concrete wall, and be charged as the trigger man, actually be convicted as a trigger man. This doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. But this is what happened in the court. And 11 jury members agreed to such a, a narrative, such a uh, travesty of the judicial carryout in a democracy in a democracy. This is the case. This is the case. How can a, a judge, much less, who said towards the end of this case that he normally calls a mistrial, but he, he's been told by both sides to continue on. A mistrial speaks to any carriage a miscarriage of, ju uh, uh, of justice. In this case, this is definitely what it is. And Justice Danbroff, in the first trial, called a mistrial after the second day of uh, deliberations because the jury was deadlocked. And actually, in that case, there was a Canadian woman of darker pigment who, during the detectives uh, testifying, Gantz, um, to the word ratchet, spoke out from the jury, out loud, that ratchet means dirty street whore. She said this while Detective Gantz was in the middle of his testifying that ratchet does not relate to the context of the text. 
She said this out loud. This is very interesting. This is very important. Because it speaks to a jury member that actually listened to the case, weighed and measured the uh, proceedings, unbiased of uh, previous criminal history as a juvenile, associations, or anything else. She weighed what was put in front of her and was honest about that which she knew or did not know. And this is very important because if we are going to continue with the jury system and judicial decisions, then there must be a better way to uh, to involve members of society who are blinded by social indifferences, biases, prejudices. How can these be left outside the courtroom so justice can reign and evidence can be seen outside the social spectrum? This is a very important question. Very important question. Because I sit and I measure this case and one can't help but think about other cases and other individuals that are sitting in uh, penitentiaries uh, unjustified are either based upon uh, assumptions by sleek, sleek crowns using manipulating words, videotapes, pictures, repetitively, repetitively, mantras, detectives sitting in the courtroom behind the prosecutors, non-lawyers looking in the face of the jury, intimidation factors, body language, shuffling through folders, shaking their head up and down, yes and no, and the judge not speak to this. This is not justice, ladies and gentlemen. This is a bully, and in this case, a bully court case, two court cases, where um, justice was not served, but rather the biases and prejudices of certain individuals were relayed to those in the jury who also felt those same prejudices and biases and felt that solidarity in these biases and prejudices was more important than the carrying out of proper judgment and weighing this criminal case, which involves an individual who's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And being proven guilty is based upon weighing what has been presented as so-called evidence. That's the situation. And this is why we are in the middle of an appeal. Um, we're not here, this video is not about bashing the judicial system. It's about rooting out the errors errors and pointing out errors in law uh, as opposed to um, errors in personalities, biases, prejudices uh, based upon assumptions and presuppositions of a social issue that must stay outside of the courtroom where the wane of evidence, be it circumstantial or solid evidence, be weighed by a jury of the accused, accuser's peers. That's the situation. All right, so I'm open to your comments. Um, This case is, um, like I said, the appeals is ongoing. Psychological effects 
basketball, I'm just adjusting. It's, it is what it is. Um, we would just hope that the judges, not the appeals judges, but the judges from the prior cases, um, if it was a miscarriage of judgment, they'd be reprimanded, as well as the prosecution uh, who made assumptions in front of the jury, um, falsified evidence, detectives falsified statements to potential witnesses um, be brought to justice themselves. Shalom Alekum.